and welcome once again employment law show we are back at it good to have you along for the ride john skulls lior samfiru reach out to lior anytime samfiru to market llp stlawyers.ca you can uh, phone him anytime and his crew 1-855-821-5900 help at employmentlawyer.ca we'll give you some more contact information throughout the show websites and uh, etc etc on the show we always have a main topic don't we and this week it's going to be common myths about severance packages that is huge information for you to know because all of us at one time or another over our 30, 40 year career, eh, there's a good chance that you're going to be uh, having that meeting in a, in a room with frosted glass and there'll be the package and the banker's box and there you go. You're going you're gonna to want to know what to do next. And Lior is going to tell you in just a bit. That's coming up. We'll get to some phone calls from our live radio shows and a whole bunch more and maybe some email. But we always start off, pal, with the, uh, the week that was or case of the day. What have you got in store this week? Hey, John. Awesome to be here to talk about employment law to help all our good viewers with this very important, relevant, essential topic. We want to make sure that everyone understands their rights. You have very good rights, extensive rights, many rights in the workplace. Too many people, they don't know what they are or whatever they think they know may not be the full story. Well, you'll get the full story here about what to do if you lost your job, what to do if your employer won't accommodate you, if you're not treated properly at work, if your job or hours or pay has changed. All those things are covered by employment law. All those things are addressed by what the law says your employer can and cannot do. So we touch on those, we arm you with that information, but of course this is only a 30 minute show beyond this show. We're not going anywhere. You can always reach me in the office. You can call and email. We can have that private discussion and I can roll up my sleeves and do more than just tell you about your rights, actually help you enforce those rights. I'm not just some guy that shows up on TV. Let's make sure we actually help you enforce those rights. But always like to start off with the situation that came across my desk uh, very recently. I spoke with a lady that because of a very serious medical condition was off work uh, for about six months or so and she applied for disability benefits, got those disability benefits and was working hard with her doctor and, and therapists on uh, getting better, getting ready to come back to work. Well, after about six or you know, close to seven months, she gets contacted by her insurer who says, we're planning to cut you off those benefits. We don't agree that you should continue being on disability. We think you're ready to come back to work. Surprise to her, of course, because she did not feel ready. Her doctor was telling her uh, she's not ready. Well, while she's still digesting this bad news, she gets uh, uh, an email from her employer saying, well, we understand you're not going to be on benefits in, in a few weeks. We need you to be back at work. So, of course, very concerned because she doesn't want to lose her job. She needs her benefits and she's being kind of attacked from both angles. She, thankfully, she does the right thing she calls us. She wants to understand what does she do with those things. Well, let's deal with the insurance company first. The idea, of course, with an insurance company is they'd like to get you off their payroll. They'd like to cut you off those benefits and, and tell you that you can go back to work even though you may not be ready. Very common. The good thing is once they hear from us, once they call, they get called on that, we call them on that, they'll either keep you on benefits or there'll be compensation uh, that's owed to you. So right there I told her, don't worry, we got you when it comes to your insurance company, we'll deal with them. Now with respect to the employer, it's even more obvious. It doesn't matter what the insurance company says. If your doctor gives you a doctor's note says you, that says you can't work, that's it. Your employer cannot do anything to you. They need to allow you that time off work. Your doctor is what matters, not what the insurance company says, not what the insurance company doctor says, no. It's what your doctor says. So in this situation, as soon as I contact uh, her employer, they'll back off. But I wanted to remind everyone here on your rights, when it comes to being off on disability, ultimately, if you cannot work and you're, you know that, your doctor knows that, both your insurance company and your employer should allow you that time off and make sure there's no unneeded pressure on you to do something wrong. How much leeway does your employer have when it comes to you being off work? Because you know, you've seen it countless times where it's like, uh, yeah, we'd like to know what's wrong with you. You know, what's your blood pressure? What's your ailment? How long are you going to be off? You know, what doctors are you seeing? What medications are you on? Those questions come. And how much can they know? I mean, you can tell them everything, but you don't have to, right? Well, I've seen employers say, we want your entire medical file, medical history for years. Well, no, nonsense. You can't demand that. You have a right to privacy. None of that is relevant to your employer. Your employer is okay to ask you, how long can you be off? Or will you be off? What kind of accommodation do you need? Can we provide some help and support so you can come back to work? Those are legitimate questions that you have to have answered by your doctor. But 
the other questions that John was mentioning, that I was mentioning, what is your condition, what medication you're taking, what treatment you're taking, we want your doctor's notes. Offside, not allowed to do that. You have a right to your privacy, and your employer should not demand that information. We've heard as well, Leor, cases where somebody's uh, they've been on disability, so they're off work for a while, and then for whatever reason, uh, cutbacks. Maybe they, the company's gone belly up. I don't know. They lose their job, and they figure, okay, my job is gone. Does that mean my benefits cease as well? Or now they're on a different track, are they not? So absolutely. So if you're on disability benefits and you're, you lose your job, even let's assume for a second that it's legitimate reasons. They're not picking on you. They're not doing that because you're sick. That does not stop your benefits. You can continue being on benefits, on disability benefits until 65. So the fact that you may have lost your job does not mean you lose your benefits, your disability benefits. That said, keep in mind, you may be owed a significant amount of severance. So even if the reason you lost your job is legitimate, the company did not do anything to pick on you, they may still owe you a a lot more sevens than you realize. All right, let's move on. As I mentioned off the top of the show, you can always catch Lior and myself doing a radio show. Been doing that for know, 11, 12 years. Employmentlawyer.ca. Go to the media tab and you'll find a station close to you that will catch, uh, take our show. And you have an opportunity all week to call into the show and ask your questions. We like to take some of those phone calls, cherry pick them because they're so good. We talk about them here. And again, it's an education and it gives you some answers as well. So let's get to the first phone call for this show right now, Lior. Listen up. One of my friends who we've been trying to persuade to call on Leo's office, let's say he works with a company he has for the last 39 years. He's actually a manager with this company. And all they've offered is 32 weeks severance. And we're telling him not to sign anything. How many years has he been there? 39. Don't sign anything. Good advice. Great Good advice. advice. Absolutely outrageous, by the way, yeah. to think that someone after 39 years, 39 years, that's probably most of his life, uh, be getting 32 weeks pay. That's not even close. This is a common situation. People believe, oh, it's a week per year. 32 weeks, 39 years, that's close to a week per year. <laughs> Maybe that's good enough. Nonsense. It's not a week per year of service. It's much, much more in most cases. Now, this person after 39 years would probably be owed the maximum, okay, the maximum that someone would be getting in a severance situation. There's just not a lot of people that have worked for 39 years for the same employer. So I can tell you how much severance he's owed. It's not 32 weeks. Let's show you how much severance he's owed. We're going to go back to our useful tool that we talk about often. That's the severance calculator. You can find that at pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. So this person in a, in a managerial role, 39 years of service. We don't know the age, but probably not 40 years old. We see he was offered 32 weeks of severance. He's owed 24 months severance, two years. So he was offered, I don't know, seven and a half months. He's owed 24 months. Wrongful dismissal because he's owed that more, much more. So definitely, definitely he should not sign that offer. He's owed three times that. Make sure we speak and I help enforce those rights. And again, as Lior mentioned, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Rolled into that is that severance calculator. Lior can do it off the top of his head at this point. But for you and I, we can use that tool absolutely freely. Even if you haven't lost your job, just to see how much severance would be, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. It's fantastic. Uh, phone call number two. Too. Let's get into that now as well. I've been in an industry for about eight years. If I were to tell my boss I think that maybe I need some type of leave, and then if I did come back, start working again for another two or three months, and this type of uh, injury comes back, it's the type of industry that I'm in where I'm starting to lose feeling in my hands. But at 50 years old, not a lot of employers out there that would probably consider looking at an old dog. What do you think? Well, first of all, the key is to understand that his employer, his current employer, has to accommodate him. So if there's jobs that he can no longer do because of his medical condition, there may be other jobs that he is able to do. So the starting point, of course, is with a doctor's note. Tell the, have the doctor tell your employer what you can and cannot do, and at that point, the onus, the burden shifts to the employer to do whatever it needs to to accommodate, to provide your work that, they, that you can do. If they don't do that, if they don't try, if they don't want to go there, well, it's a human rights violation. There's going to be significant compensation owed to you because of that. Now, in a situation where the company has tried, they really tried, but there's just nothing. There's no possibility to accommodate you. They may be able to terminate your employment with significant severance. And the fact that it's going to be harder for you to find another job because of your medical condition impacts the amount of severance. It means you get even more severance. So individuals that are let go when their health is not optimal, and because of that, they're going to take longer to find another job, 
guess what? They're owed more severance. And that, and that accommodation you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's the duty of every employer, but the, the larger, the more you know, resources I guess the employer has, the higher the threshold, right? It's going to be very difficult for a large company with a lot of resources, a lot of employees to say, oh my gosh, this is just not possible. It's going to be a lot harder for them to say that than a small company with one employee. So yes, the bigger the company, the more resources, the more options they have, the harder it is for them to say, we just can't accommodate. Two great phone calls right there, but they always come in threes on this show. We'll do the other one on the other side of the break, so stick around for that. In the meantime, write down that number again, 1-855-821-5900 and help at employmentlawyer.ca. We'll continue. Lots more of the Employment Law Show is just ahead. Stay there. People think you have to sign back a severance offer by a deadline. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Deadlines are used as a pressure tactic. Make sure the offer is fair before you sign. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. Can insurance companies deny long-term disability claims for mental illness? When you're suffering from a mental health disability, insurance companies just don't understand. But we do. They can absolutely not force you back to work. If your doctors say you are not ready and you know you're not ready, they cannot make you go back to work. If you have a mental health disability and your claim is denied, don't give up. Give us a call and let us fight for you. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think you aren't owed severance pay if you are fired for a reason. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Most for-cause terminations are false and you are still owed full severance. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, welcome back, Employment Law Show. We're back. As mentioned, three phone calls per show is how we handle them from our radio show, employmentlawyer.ca, to tune into a station near you, uh, across Ontario at least, and in the GTA here as well. Anytime you want to catch, phone into the show, ask your questions. Do not be bashful all week long when we're on air. To do so may appear on this show. Lior, let's get to phone call number three right now. If I went from a department manager to a section manager uh, because they eliminated the department manager role, my wage stayed the same. It was a shift change. It went from a Monday to Friday job to a continental 12-hour shift. And there's rumors another change pending within the next couple of months. Does constructive dismissal kick in at this point? What do you think about that? So I think the biggest change there is the change in the shift. shift yeah. Not the role necessarily. I mean, it's a change in role, no doubt. But it may not be significant enough to actually be a constructive dismissal. But if you used to work regular day shifts and now it's a continental shift and then it changes, that's a big deal. That absolutely can be a constructive dismissal. Anytime your hours change in a significant way, yeah, that could be a constructive dismissal. You don't have to accept that. You may be able to treat that as a termination and get seven. So that's that's an option. Now, if this change happened a while ago and he's continued working, by now he may have been considered to have accepted it. So he has to keep an eye on future changes. But generally speaking, anytime we have a change in hours, and I'm not talking about instead of 8 to 4, you're working 9 to 5, that may not be significant. But if you go from days to nights to continentals, big change, constructive dismissal. What is, if he'd accepted to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a team guy, I'm, you know, I love where I work, maybe I'll just give this a shot, or maybe I do decide to do it for three or four months, and all of a sudden, it's not working, I don't want to do this again. So you can take it, you like to say for a spin, take yeah. it for a test drive, so to speak. The way you would do that is you would tell your employer, hey, employer, I have real concerns about this. I'm not sure that this is the right thing, but I'm willing to try this for the next one, two, three months. And after that, I'll see how things are. So you can do it that. Don't, it can't be much more than two or three months. But if you tell your employer that you're not accepting this, you're just doing this for a period of time to see how it goes. After that period of time, you still have the ability to say that's a constructive dismissal. In writing. Always in writing, right? If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. You got it. Main topic, common myths about severance packages. Let's get to that as well. Lior got a lot of these to get through. Number one, myth one, you are not entitled to a severance package if let go during probation. So very common myth. A lot of people believe, a lot of employers believe genuinely that if you're during the quote-unquote probationary period, you don't get severance if you are let go. That's not necessarily the case. First of all, let's start by the fact that probation is not automatic. So just because you started a job, let's say you've been there for one or two months, whatever it is, you're not automatically on probation, not at all. You're only on probation if you sign an employment agreement that specifically says the first three months you're on probation, and it specifically says that during that time, you can be let go without severance. 
If you've signed something like that, then maybe you're on probation for three months, but that's it. So probation is not automatic. Second thing is that probationary period, even if it exists through an employment agreement, really can only be three months. So after three months, if you're let go, irrespective of what an employment agreement says, you still have to get your full severance. So if your employer says you're on probation for six months, whatever it is, you still get your severance. So for most people, the net effect of all this is yes, even if you're let go when you're on probation, you still get severance. And that language needs to be pretty specific when it comes to the probation, right? It does, it does. And it, it, it's not automatic. You always have to go back to that employment agreement. So that's probably reason 1021 why you want to have me take a look at that employment agreement before you sign it. Okay, severance myth number two. Severance packages must be accepted immediately or by the employer's deadline, which could be 48 hours. Or yeah, you know, anywhere from one to five days is kind of what most employers provide to sign. And uh, it's a deadline. Usually it's bold, uh, bolded and underlined in that Scary. severance letter. Oh my God, look, they mean that. They say, I'm not going to get this. So that deadline, you know, clock is ticking. I have to sign this. No, you don't. Your legal rights don't expire by that deadline. You've heard me say this before. Your legal rights, in fact, don't expire for two whole years. So if that's the case, why does that deadline exist? It's a pressure tactic. That's all it is. It's intended to make the employee that just lost his or her job feel that sense of urgency and fear so that they accept that offer, which is very likely a bad offer. So your employer is making you a bad offer, but they really want you to sign it because they're saving a lot of money if you sign it. So they're going to put a deadline there hoping that that's going to convince you to sign. Don't do it. If you watch the show, you know better now. You know you can't sign it. You know your legal rights don't expire by then. You have two years. Let's make sure you get what you're owed, and you can't do that if you sign off on that offer. We're covering off some common myths when it comes to severance packages on this week in the show. Number three, Lior, everyone in a company gets the same amount of severance pay as their coworkers. So what we often see is an employee compare, comparing notes with their colleagues if they've been let go. So a company let go of five people. Oh, we all got it the same. We all got a week per year, two weeks per year. So that must be right. No, not at all. It doesn't matter what everyone got. Okay. The law looks at everyone individually. Your rights are going to be different than someone else's. The main factors, of course, are your age, your position, and the length of your employment. And it's very likely that all five of those people have been wrongfully dismissed and they're owed more. So no, don't worry about what anyone else did or did not get. Make sure you assess your own entitlements if you sign off on that severance package, it's too late to go back. All right, let's get to a couple more of these uh, myths before we take a break, Leo. Number four is if, if you are forced to resign from your job, forced, you're not owed any severance. Well, a resignation, a resignation, if you truly resign, you don't get severance because you do, the, you do that voluntarily. You do that on your own. Well, if you've been forced to resign, you're no longer doing that on your own. You're doing it because someone made you, threatened you, pushed you into doing that. So the law considers that to be a termination of employment. If you've been forced to resign and you can show that you resigned because you've been forced, that's a termination. And guess what? You still get your full severance. We'll get to one more here. Severance only encompasses your basic salary and wages. That's it. I can almost guarantee most people, when you look at your severance letter, the amount of money that the company says they're going to pay you is based on your base salary only. They probably have not included your vacation properly, your benefits, your bonus, your car allowance, your stock options, your Especially pension. Your sales, right? In sales, that could be a huge factor. Well, guess what? Severance is not just your base pay. Severance has to include all components of your compensation. You simply ask yourself, would I have received this had I continued working? And if the answer is yes, it has to be part of your severance. So severance is not just about the number of weeks or months that you're getting paid. It's also what's included in that. That's why it's so important we speak if you lose your job. Lots more to go here as we get into a break. Terminationquestions.com, another free anonymous website for you to do that. Exactly. Ask some questions. We'll go to that on the other side of the break right here on the Employment Law Show. Stick around. People think you should go to the government to get severance pay. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Government can only help you get minimum severance, but not everything you're entitled to. Always check with The Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. If your long-term disability claim is denied, should you appeal? Appeals often fail because insurance companies control the process. So long as you appeal, you're playing by their rules. You should never appeal the denial of your disability benefits. Appeals are just a mirage of false hope. Don't. That's their process. Take it out of their hands and fight for your rights with our help. 
Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think their employer can make changes to their job. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. Your employer can't change your pay, hours, or duties. You may be entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back to the Employment Law Show. Again, John Scholes, Lior Samfiru. Reach out to Lior anytime, employmentlawyer.ca, and to email help at employmentlawyer.ca. Phone number 1 855 821 5900. All kinds of options to get your questions answered by Lior and his team. Another one is terminationquestions.com. Terminationquestions.com. Free, anonymous, use it whenever you like. It may appear on this show as well. For this week, Lior, here we go. I'm a dental assistant and have been employed for eight years. The owner of the business has announced his retirement and future closure of the office in about six months. I'm almost 60 and nervous that this will mean months of uncertainty and unemployment. Am I owed anything other than the notice of closure? So I see this often with doctor offices, whether it's dentists, chiropractors, even family doctors, where they know they're going to closing down their office, and what they do is they give notice. So we're going to close in two months, six months, a year. Well, here's the thing. That amount of notice that you got that you're losing your job counts towards your severance. It does count. So the effect of that is it may reduce the amount of severance that you get. But that doesn't mean you still don't get severance on the back end. Now, if you got sufficient amount of notice, it may be that you're not owed anything more. But in most cases, the vast majority of them, the amount of notice that you've received is not enough to completely extinguish your severance right. So in this case, this person got six months of notice, been there about eight or nine years. So let's see what this person is actually owed, and let's see if that six months notice is enough. We're going to go back and use our severance calculator. You can find that at pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. So you see there, she's uh, in her 50s, she's a dental assistant, eight years, got six months notice or, or several months working notice in any event. Well, we see she's owed about 10 months. So it's 10 months less the amount of notice and there's still several months of pay that she's owed. So that's why it's so important. Even in a situation where you get advance notice, you may still be owed more once that notice expires. That's why you call to make sure that we do it right. Lior does a lot of live streaming. You catch him on Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn as well. Want to join that show at stlawyers.ca. Uh, the question for this week, Lior, after repeated complaints, my company refuses to reprimand or deal with a manager that has made many inappropriate comments and has criticized my performance as it relates to my disability. What can I do? That's yeah, you know, this is worth spending some time uh, discussing. So, you know, let's, before we talk about this situation, let's talk about the employer's obligations generally. So this could be a human rights violation, of course, when someone is mistreating you, bullying you, talking down to you because you have a medical condition. It's illegal. I don't need to be an employment law expert to say that. It should be obvious. Beyond that, anytime we're talking about inappropriate conduct, harassment in the workplace, your employer has to deal with it. They have to investigate it, take it very seriously, and ultimately rectify that problem. They can't allow it to continue. So what happens in this situation, you should always tell your employer that something has gone wrong, that you're not being treated, that you're being discriminated against, because then the onus, that burden, shifts to that employer to deal with it. They cannot, by law, ignore it. Well, now, going back to this scenario that, that uh, we just talked about, the employer did not do anything. They didn't really get engaged, they didn't help, uh, they ignored it. Well, here's what I would do. I would follow up in writing, and it's to always be in writing, right? Because you don't want the employer to deny knowing about it. Send an email, hey employer, I told you before about this issue with the colleague or the supervisor, nothing has happened, I'm asking you to please deal with that. Now, if at that point the employer gets its stuff together and deals with it, fantastic, problem solved. If it doesn't, if it ignores the issue, if it doesn't properly deal with it, let's talk about it. I can force the company to deal with it, or I can get the employee out of there with compensation. But I always want to have that in writing. I want to make sure that your employer cannot deny knowing about it. Your employer cannot deny you telling them. So send that email, put it in writing, protect yourself. And if your employer doesn't do what it's supposed to, I'm right here. Let's talk. 
Yeah, because you can pretty much guarantee that an employer is not going to say without writing, oh, yeah, I did say that. Yeah, no, you were right. They're not. They're going to deny left, right, and Of center. course. They'll say, you know, we, you didn't tell us, we didn't know, or we, 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 we thought everything was fine. You told us not to worry about it. So they'll deny it. You're right. They're not going to say, yes, we made a mistake. Yes, we dropped the ball. So that's why you, you corroborate your own story. You back it up by having it in writing. And if your employer says something verbally and he says, well, they, they kind of got a, uh, away with it because they said it verbally, well, no. Write them back confirming what they told you verbally. Hey, employer, confirming today at 2 o'clock when we met you told me X, Y, and Z. Protect yourself, put it in writing. That's what you give me the, you give me the ammunition to help you. So very important to do that. You know, I always ask you this question, too, when it comes to this particular topic. And what if the person doing the harassing is the one you're supposed to report to. So there's really nobody there. There's no boss above boss, right? Yeah, so if, if your harasser is the ultimate decision maker, the, right. the, the highest person in the company, it's not going to work if you go to complain someone in the company. Nothing is going to be done. So at that point, all we have to do is establish that the harassment has happened. Do we have emails? Do we have recordings? Do we have a witness? As long as we can prove the harassment, we don't need to deal with the company internally. We can deal with it through me externally okay we can deal with that either get the company to change course or more likely just get you out of there with compensation but i always want to have the ability to prove what's been happening does that could there possibly be an increase in severance or human rights damages because of this is that absolutely it, it, when it's bad conduct like this when the employer is dropping the ball if it's impacted the person's health all those are reasons why a company may have to pay additional severance so yet another reason why we have to talk all right, here we go. We wrap up every show with this particular segment, the Employment Law Show, Rapid Fire. Let's get into it. Okay, Lior, you're in the hot seat again, pal. Number one, can my employer cancel my approved vacation period? That's not nice. That's not nice. In some cases, your employer can do that as long as they've given you notice in advance and as long as you haven't relied on it. You haven't gone out and spent money buying tickets and booking hotels. In some cases, your employer can do that. In most cases, if you've relied on the vacation approval, it's too late for them to do that and you can't, punish, you can't be punished for going ahead with the vacation. Number two, can my employer put me on a performance improvement plan? They can, but a performance improvement plan needs to be legitimate. It needs to be done for good reasons and it needs to be accurate and fair. If it's not, if you feel your employer is not treating you fairly, that performance improvement plan is just an excuse. It's made up. It's not accurate. Say so in writing. Protect yourself. Don't be silent. Silence could be the same as accepting it. So always say something in writing. Rapid fire question number three is this. Can my employer ask me to sign oh, a new contract? Generally, no. A new contract is bad news. If your employer just wants you to sign a new contract, there's a reason, and it's not a good reason for you, and you cannot be disciplined or punished for refusing. So, as they say, just say no. <laughs> just say no. Number four is this, Lior. Can my employer tell me to work at a new, distant location? Somewhere. Well, generally speaking, the threshold that I go by is an hour. If the new location is going to increase your commute by more than an hour, potentially that could be a constructive dismissal. So while you can't tell your employer or you can't force your employer to not do it, if they go ahead and relocate you further an hour, you may be able to say that's a constructive dismissal. Now I get my full severance. Not a distance inconvenience, a time inconvenience. It's not about the number of kilometers. Right. It's not about the specific location. It's how it's going to impact you in terms of getting to work, whether it means you have to take another bus or subway, etc. That is going to be the factor. Number five, can my employer put me on a temporary layoff until further notice? No. A temporary left in most cases is a termination. Whether they have a date of recall or they don't, you may be able to treat that as a termination and get severance. And our last question for this week on Rapid Fire is, can my employer reduce my pay due to performance reasons? No, your pay cannot be reduced in most cases, absolutely not. Generally, there's a tiny leeway if your employer makes significant reductions to pay, constructive dismissal, by the way, even if your performance may not be up to par. They have a little bit of leeway, maybe a little bit here and there. Tiny little bit yeah. of leeway, maybe 10%. Anything more, constructive dismissal. And that is it for this week. It is a wrap. Thank you so much for your contributions on the phones to the radio stations and emails, etc. You can always reach out to Lior now that we are done for the week. Phone numbers first, 1-855-821-5900. Help at employmentlawyer.ca. And that website, keep it, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca with access to the severance calculator. Thank you so much, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Employment Law Show.